All right, so with the first two questions from the challenge questions of this week under our belt, we'll tackle the last two, question three and question four. And for question three, we're going to go back to something that was mentioned in the lecture, but we didn't really have time to cover in class, and that's how we tie sex-linked traits into population genetics, how we think about population genetics questions from a sex-linked perspective. So this question here talks about a population in Iceland where the trait is X-linked, and the sampling experiment indicates that about 6% of the men are colorblind, the typical recessive X-linked trait of colorblindness. And we're told to assume that this population mates randomly. That's our key phrase to tell us that this population is definitely in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So let's go back to what we had said in class about Hardy-Weinberg genetics and math. We made the case that the reason why the frequency of being homozygous dominant was equal to p squared was because the probability of picking one dominant allele was equal to p, and the probability of picking a second dominant allele was equal to p. And when you multiply those together, you get p squared. Keeping that in mind, let's think about the frequency of being recessive for a sex-linked trait as a male. Let's think about what that might equal from a Hardy-Weinberg's perspective. Again, if we use the same approach, what we really need to do is we need to reach into that gene pool and pick out the first recessive allele, that colorblind allele. Well, if it's recessive and we're picking it out, it's going to be due to the frequency or the probability of getting a recessive allele. And the frequency of the recessive allele, hopefully you remember, is Q. And then for males, we don't get to pick again, do we? Because the Y chromosome doesn't have any alleles on it. That's the whole principle of sex linkage. So when we're dealing with sex-linked traits, and in this case sex-linked traits that are recessive, the frequency of the trait in males is equal to Q. The 6% of males that we see in this population represents that 6% of the time a single recessive allele was plucked out of that gene pool, period. That's why 6% of the males are colorblind. That means 6% of the gene pool is made up of recessive alleles. That means Q equals 6%. But 6% not, isn't really a frequency, is it? So let's make that correct and say that Q is 0 0.06. Same thing. Now we should be able to calculate P because P plus Q always equals 1. So p is equal to 0.94. And we should have everything we need to answer the rest of these questions. So a asks us what percentage of men carry the recessive C allele. Well, the percentage of men that carry the recessive C allele is 6%. That's why 6% of them are colorblind. What percentage of women carry at least one copy of that allele? Well, there are two types of women who can carry at least one copy of this colorblind allele. We can have women who are carriers, but aren't colorblind because they have a dominant allele. Or we can have women that are themselves colorblind, and they're carrying two recessive alleles. Well, Hardy-Weinberg tells us that the frequency of being heterozygotic is 2pq, and the frequency of being homozygotic recessive is Q squared. So the total number of women who are carrying at least one recessive allele should be the sum of these two frequencies. And let's do the math there. I'm going to get down my calculator. And I'm going to go for the heterozygotes first. So I'm plugging into my calculator 2 times p, which we've already said is 0.94, times q, which is 0 0.06, and I get a value of 0 0.1128, or 11.28%. And then for q squared, I'm going to do 0 0.06 times itself, and I get a frequency of 0 0.0036, or 0.36%. Now, if we want the percentage of women who are carrying at least one recessive allele, 
then we need to take those two individual percentages, 11.28, and add them, 0.36, and we get a sum total answer of 11.64% of women are carrying at least one recessive allele. Now we go a little further here. We don't really need to do any more math because B asks us what percentage of women are expected to be colorblind. So we have to go back to this and think about which one of these women would we expect to be colorblind. Well, only the homozygotic recessive ones would be colorblind. We've already calculated that percent as 0.36, and so that's going to be the answer here. 0.36% of the women are going to be colorblind. And notice genetically the difference. We, we were aware of this empirically when we talked about sex-linked traits initially. We talked about sex-linked traits when they're recessive being much, much more common in males than in females. And we understood why, because males only get one allele and females get two. But now we see it mathematically in a population genetics perspective. 6% of males are colorblind and only a third of a percent of females are colorblind because of that difference between one or two alleles in sex-linked traits. What percentage of the total population are colorblind? Now that's a much more interesting question. Let me clean some of this up. So we know from the question itself that 6% of males are colorblind. And we've just calculated that 6 that 0.36% of females are colorblind. So if we add those together, we get a total of 6.36%. But when we add those together, we're actually doubling the population, aren't we? There's approximately 50% of the population is men and 50% is women, more or less. So when we add these percentages together, we're actually doubling the entire population. In other words, we're considering that out of a 200% population. That's not what we want to do. We want to get things down to 100%, so we need to divide these both by 2. When we divide 200% by 2, we of course understand that we are once again normalizing for 100% of the human population. And when we divide 6.36% by 2, we're going to get 3.18%. 3.18% of the entire population in Iceland is colorblind. Yes, we understand that for the males, it's 6% of all the males. And for the females, it's 0.36% of all the females. But if you were to lump all those people together into one room and ask how many of these people, gender aside, are colorblind, 3.18% of them are colorblind. So this is 3.18%. What percentage of colorblind individuals are men? Well, now that's a different question as well, too, isn't it? We know that 6% of the men are colorblind, but that's not what D is asking. D is asking, of all the colorblind individuals that are out there, how many of them are men? Well, let's go back to this reasoning here. 6% of men are colorblind. But if we were to take the men and add in the women, again, getting that 200% of the population. If we were to take the men, add in the women, so we've doubled our population size, we would now say that 3% of the men are colorblind in that total population. So when men and women are considered together, 3% of that entire population of Iceland with men and women together are colorblind men. 3% of that population taken together of all the individuals in Iceland are colorblind men. Out of a total of 3.18% being colorblind men and women. So what percentage of the colorblind individuals are men? Well, 3% of the total 3.18% are the men. So if we simply do 3 divided by 3.18, we get a percentage of 94.3%. Of all the colorblind individuals in Iceland, 94.3% of them are men. What percentage of individuals in the population are expected to be normal carriers for the colorblind allele? So men can't be carriers. Men either show the trait or they don't. 
and colorblind women aren't carriers either. The only carriers we have are the heterozygous women. These are our normal carriers. They can see vision, they can see color normally, but they're carriers. Well, we already did this math, unfortunately I erased it, so we'll have to redo it again. But Hardy Weinberg says, well, any heterozygotic condition is going to be equal to 2PQ. In this case, that's equal to 2 times 0.94 times 0 0.06. So 2 times 0.94 times 0 0.06 gives us 11 0.28% of the population are carriers. But we should pause a minute here, because men can't be carriers. Only women can be. So really, it's only fair to say that 11.28% of women are carriers. Those are only women. That's all it pertains to. Now we add in the men, because it says here, of the total population, if we add in the men, we double the effective population size. Once again, we're dealing with that scenario where we're dealing with 200% of our population, 100% of the men and 100% of the women, to get back to our 100% to normalize for the entire population, because essentially we've diluted the women's effect with an equal number of men. We have to divide this by 2 as well. So while 11.28% of women are carriers, when it comes to the total population, 5.6% of them are carriers. Question E is my favorite, uh, question F is my favorite question of the bunch here. After two generations, what percentage of men in the population will be colorblind and what percentage will have normal vision? Don't need any math there. All we need to remember in order to get that question right is that when it comes to Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, the main thing that that implies, the main thing that that tells us, is that all allele and genotypic frequencies are stable and predictable from generation to generation. So if 6% of the males are colorblind right now, and 94% of the males can see normal color right now, then two generations from now, 6% of them will be colorblind and 94% will be normal. And eight generations from now, 6% of them will be colorblind and 94% of them will be normal. And 3,567 generations from now, 6% of those males will be colorblind and 94% will be normal regardless of anything else because this population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So that's how we would go about tackling number three. Now I will say that question three is an example of a question that's a little bit tougher than what I'd ask you to do on an exam. So this is swinging uh, pretty high here in terms of what I would ask you to do. Would sex linkage be part of the exam when it comes to population genetics? Sure, it could be. But would I ask you to delve this deeply into the numbers, especially when it comes to these kinds of questions here, where we have to remember to have these percentages in order to get the right answer? Uh, no, I wouldn't quite make it that hard on an exam. So let's wrap up here with question four, the last question from these challenge questions. This question has you consider the Florida panther. This is a uh, based on truth, this case here. By the mid-1980s, the population of Florida panthers had dwindled to fewer than 30 total individuals in the population. That's a very, very endangered species near extinction. Furthermore, within this population, there was a high frequency of detrimental traits. This normally happens when population dwindles to such a small size, including low sperm count, undescended testicles in the males, and these kinked tails in both sexes. The future for this population was bleak provide an explanation for the observed detrimental traits, in other words, why are we seeing these detrimental traits uh, emerge, and provide a possible solution that would increase the likelihood that the population would rebound and preserve the genetic identity of this unique population. So essentially, what we're getting at in the first part is that we had a bottleneck. That's really what happened here. There was a very, very large population of panthers uh, when they were inhabiting their natural habitat. But as the question says, 
for various reasons, their population number dwindled all the way down to 30. That's a bottleneck. When you have a bottleneck, the only alleles that you have are the alleles in those 30 individuals. The allele pool is severely depleted. And so whatever recessive alleles remain in that allele pool, they get emphasized. It's almost like they get amplified because there are no other dominant alleles to mask them, to cover them. So we always see the emergence of detrimental traits upon a bottleneck because we just have so few individuals there. Uh, the other thing that undermines this as well is after a few generations with such small numbers, all of the panthers become cousins of one another. They're all related because it is such a small tribe. And so they have no choice but to interbreed with one another because their numbers are so small. And interbreeding also brings about detrimental traits because when we have inbreeding, we have a much greater chance of becoming homozygous recessive. We talk about that in the lecture as well. So those two things are related. The bottleneck uh, causes the context for inbreeding to be prevalent, and inbreeding itself results in the emergence of being homozygous recessive, which brings about detrimental phenotypes. Provide a possible solution. Well, there are two possible solutions here, but only one of them is right. The first possible solution is to find the most closely related panther to the Florida panthers and breed those panthers in to this strain, to this subspecies. Now that's typically what's done in animal breeding. So people who are familiar with the breeding of horses or cats or dogs already know that when deleterious traits begin to emerge in animals that are bred, the best course of action is to outbreed them, to go to very, very related subspecies, to go to related strains, and to breed them. That increases your genetic diversity, that brings new alleles into the mix, uh, and it can certainly have a bottleneck rebound. So we all call that outcrossing. Bring in new alleles, healthy alleles, from other subspecies, uh, other populations. Now this is the wrong answer. And the reason why it's a wrong answer is because we have a corollary in the question. It says preserve the genetic identity of this population. That's one thing that outbreeding or outcrossing does not do. It brings the alleles and the genetic signature of those other subspecies into the mix. We can't do that here. Here we want to preserve the genetic identity of the Florida panthers but still have them rebound. So the other course of action, the more correct course of action here, is selective breeding. What you would do is you would identify in that small dwindling population of Florida panthers, you would identify the most healthy, those with higher sperm counts, those with lesser kinked tails, those that were the most robust. And you would only mate the healthiest males with the healthiest females. And you would block, you would stop the unhealthy individuals from breeding. In the next generation, you are going to enrich the pool of alleles for healthy alleles, for dominant alleles. And then you'll repeat. In the F1 of that selective breeding, you would identify the most healthy cubs let them grow up to sexual maturity and only allow them to mate. The lesser healthy cubs you would block from breeding. And in the third generation you would do the same. In the fourth generation you would do the same. Selective breeding is always about picking the traits that are most desirable and only breeding those individuals that exhibit those traits. Now that could be how quickly a, a roaster chicken comes to a full grown maturity. It can be how many eggs an egg laying chicken lays. It could be how fast a horse is or how beautiful a dog might be. It's also the underpinnings of the eugenics movement that occurred in both Germany and the US uh, back prior to World War II, where we were trying to do selective breeding with people, finding the most desirable characteristics in humans and only allowing men and women with those traits to mate with one another, trying to make a, this super race or super generation of humans. Thankfully, of course, uh, those movements, both again in this country and in Germany, fell flat and didn't come to fruition, but the idea is the same. Pick your best in whatever best is and only mate them. That's the only strategy 
that would work for the Florida Panthers while also preserving their unique genetic identity uh, because we wouldn't require any outbreeding. We would only use the healthiest of the Panthers, breed them with one another, and hope that each subsequent generation became healthier than the one before it. So those are the four answers between these two videos to these population genetics questions. Hopefully these make a little bit more sense to you. But of course, as always, if any questions remain, you know how to get a hold of me. Please uh, get in touch with me and I'd be happy to clarify whatever I could by email.